we can uh, look at some of the same materials. If we were in person, we would have some handouts. And so what I'm gonna do um, to start is share the agenda for our meeting. So you should be able to see our agenda for tonight where we're going to start with just the kickoff, um, approve the consent agenda, which is the minutes from the last meeting and our current agenda. We have a lot of reports tonight from our local representatives with uh, assembly, school board, airport, and the police department. And then we've invited all of our state legislators because we just had our election and um, wanted to invite everybody so that they could talk about the session, which will start next year and next year, next month. <laughs> and then we have a couple other topics to discuss about um, a, a, pot a potential new ordinance about uh, homeless and transient shelters, as well as coming back to our traffic calming resolution. And then we wanna make sure that we have time for our neighborhood and community announcements. I've talked with a few folks already, and even tonight in the chat about bringing some different topics and issues forward. And that's an opportunity for everybody to share out what's going on, what issues they're um, experiencing, and if they have any, um, anything going on in their neighborhood or events to share out. And also to introduce yourself. So if this is your first uh, meeting, we, we do it at the end, but we, we do invite folks to just let, let us know who you are if this is your first meeting so you can uh, be welcomed. And so with that, I'm gonna move over to uh, our consent agenda. We have posted on our website how to find all of these. And I'm just gonna quickly show how to, how to navigate it all because it's a little tricky. Um, but we try to make it easy. So this is our community council website and all of the information for tonight's meeting is on this side. So you've got our current agenda, previous minutes, meeting handouts and resolutions to consider. Those are all linked to different things on our right side menu. Um, and so I'll navigate to them throughout the night, but just wanna make sure that you can access this and navigate around to it. So with that, we do have our, uh, minutes posted from the November 4th meeting, and we also record our meeting, so we've got that posted as well. So with that, I will entertain a motion to approve our consent agenda uh, minutes and agenda for tonight. Move to approve. Move to approve. Second. Okay, I heard Tom move and Peggy second. Mm -hmm. Okay, any discussion or changes? Okay. Then I'll also um, let everybody know that our executive board wanted to share that we have, um, oh, first I should introduce our executive board and then I'll talk about elections. So let me just stop sharing so I can look at the screen. I wanna introduce our executive board with the community council so we, and people can wave <laughs> as we go. Uh, but we've got Peggy Auth who serves as an auditor for our executive board. We have Tani Sakaricia, who is another auditor with the exec board. Uh, Meg Milkey is our secretary. Irene Person Gamble is our vice president. Julie Leonard is our another auditor. We have three auditors. And then Irina Filipenko is our treasurer. I think that's all of us. So we are seven members who, who serve as an executive board and we have uh, elections in February of next year for the new officers to start in March. So we wanna give a couple, couple months notice because uh, folks are, we welcome folks who are interested to serve on the executive board. We um, will try to have a you know, ballot of who, who will be interested and our current members are interested in staying on, but we wanna talk with folks if, if others are to let you know more about the positions. Uh, and then for voting, uh, everyone who could run or could vote uh, is, uh, there's a voting membership within our executive, within the community council. So you just have to attend one meeting within the last 12 months to be able to vote. Uh, you're a member in our council if you live or if you have a business with an address within our boundaries, but you're a voting member if you've attended one meeting prior. So we just always wanna make sure people know about that piece of it and wanted to just plug that we will have elections in February. 
So with that, I'm just gonna move us into our brief report so we can keep rolling. And, um, and actually, I promised Senator L.V. Gray Jackson that she would be able to speak earlier because she has to go to another community council meeting tonight. So before we go to the assembly report, I'm gonna turn it over to Senator Gray Jackson and then, then continue on from there. Um, so we've asked our state legislators to join us because the session is starting next month and we've asked to share different priorities and because we have six, uh, we don't invite them every single month to speak, but we do invite them to share updates with us. And so we post those to our website in our other SCC documents tab. So LV has been doing that um, every month and we're glad to have her here. And so we've invited everybody to share just for five minutes. So brief updates. And if there's time within those five minutes to um, have any discussion or questions, then we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. But also feel free to put anything in the chat and we can communicate it with folks uh, afterwards as well. So with that, uh, thanks for being here, Senator Gray Jackson. Thank you, Lindsay. It's really great to be here. I don't think I've ever been to a community council meeting with 40 participants, unless there was an issue. So this is just absolutely, absolutely wonderful. And I'm glad that, that you get my notes every month. And the first regular session of the 32nd legislature convenes on January 19th. And I wanna talk a little bit about my priorities. And I talk really fast, so I can get a lot in. Anyway, the budget is my number one priority, um, developing a comprehensive and sustainable budget. For the current budget, I want to ensure that education, Medicaid and other services that affect our most vulnerable citizens are protected. My second priority is revising the PFD formula and constitutionally protecting it now and for future generations. My third priority is making um, Juneteenth a holiday. Currently, Juneteenth is recognized in state statutes, and I'm going to introduce a bill to designate June 19th as a paid state holiday and unification with July 4th. And I want to talk a little bit before I go on to my next priority um, why this is so important. I'm bringing forward this bill to elevate Juneteenth to the level of other legal holidays like 4th of July, Labor Day, and Memorial Day. Um, it will be included in Alaska state statutes under other legal holidays. I hope that by elevating this day, we can create an environment for a better understanding of the history of race in Alaska and America. Juneteenth has been overlooked for far too long, but the events of the past this past year and the moment our nation is currently in has shown the urgent need for history to be more thoroughly understood. By elevating this day, there will be a, greatly like, a great likelihood that it'll be taught in schools as a day we recognize on the same level as the 4th of July Memorial Day. When we talk about America, we often think about higher ideals of freedom and, and, and justice, but Juneteenth is an example of how these ideas have not been applied equally. Even when President Lincoln gave the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation that took nearly three years for many enslaved African Americans, Americans to enjoy this new freedom. As we look at the world today, we can see the ramifications of hundreds of years of unequal treatment. Sadly, some people are under the impression that everyone has enjoyed the same rights that Americans of European ancestry have, but that is simply not the case. There are millions of Americans whose parents or grandparents were denied the right to vote or marry across race or attend desegregated schools. And this wasn't 500 years ago, it was barely 50. And to this day, we continue to see inequality under the law. So one of the first steps to address a big issue for me and a lot of folks in the community and make lasting change is understanding the history. And that's why I am bringing forward that bill and I just wanted to bring that to the attention of everybody ahead of time. Okay, my next priority is police reform. I've been working this summer with Senator Begich on a police reform package of bills that I call Turning Pain into Progress, also known as TPIP. There are nine proposed bills that will deal with specific policies that have been proven with data to reduce police violence. It is essential that proper training and protocols followed within the system to protect our citizens while in the line of duty. And um, I want to thank all of our heroes, the caregivers, the healthcare workers who have tirelessly been working to care for our community during this terrible pandemic. Their dedication, dedication does not go unnoticed. They put their lives on the line each day to care for the sick. And for that, I am forever grateful. I wanna wish everyone a safe and health, healthy holiday. And I hope the new year brings peace and great health to you and your families and all of us. Um, does anybody have any questions before I go to the University Community Council? 
I don't see any in the chat. I see a lot of praise and some hand clapping. So thank you for that concise thank update. Again, it's so wonderful to see everybody. I wish I could stay, but I gotta go to my next community council. I have nine, not tonight though, just two. Anyway, happy new year. Have a wonderful holiday. Bye. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to keep us moving, and, and if you do have questions or any follow-up, uh, please put in the chat and we'll make sure to follow up on it. Uh, but I will turn it over to an assembly report with uh, assembly member Cameron Presverdia. Thanks for being here. Sure, of course, and I apologize for not being here the last time we had an assembly meeting at the same time as this meeting, yeah. So, um, but I will plan to be here at all future meetings. Um, just a few quick updates, and then I want to hand it over to J Jason Bockenstead, who has been so gracious to come and, and participate in the meeting and to give an update on the most current emergency order. Um, just a few things. Um, uh, today was announced uh, the new voucher pro program. It's $1 million of CARES Act funding. And this uh, goes specifically to in individuals and households to, to support them with things like groceries and diapers and medication and gas. Um, the, the allocation is, uh, is $200 for an individual and $400 for a family. Um, and this is uh, specifically intended to, to aid in some of the impact that is being caused by the, um, the, 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 the current scenario that we find ourselves in. Um, the, the second uh, update I wanted to give was around the property acquisition. I'm sure most of you, if, if you haven't heard by, by now, um, the, the, the acquisition of the Alaska Club on Tudor, we're no longer pursuing that. And, and so the, the administration is looking at other op op options. And my understanding is, is that they have identified some potential options. And so more to come on that as soon as we know more. Um, they, we still are pursuing America's best. Um, it turns out that I, I think, and Jason can, if he wants to speak to this, but the, the cost of the, the renovation came back much higher than we expected. Um, and so they're currently working on that, but it's still in, in, the, in the conversation. And so um, as soon as I know more about what the, the result of that is gonna be, I'll, I'll report that out. So the, the America's Best is still very much in our, in our sights in terms of, of, of acquisition. And then the, um, the Golden Lion, we are planning on closing on that. So that is, that is going to ha ha happen in terms of of, of getting that, that, that property. Um, uh, the, the next thing I wanted to report on, there's been some misinformation. The, the, there's been some reporting around $20 million from the state um, of CARES Act funding. And I think there was a misunderstanding that, that that was outside of the original 156 million. It's not, that is the final payment of the 156 million that we had intended all along to get from the state. So that, that funding has already been allocated through our original allocation. And so I wanted to make sure that folks were aware of that. I've, I've, I've received several emails and phone calls about that. And I wanted to make, make sure that that was clear. And then the last quick update was around CARES Act funding. Um, as of uh, the most recent numbers we have is that $6.8 million has gone to housing assistance. Uh, that's 7,228 payments. $4.3 million has gone to small business relief and that's 472 different grants. And 5.8 million has gone to childcare assistance um, to 176 different agencies. And so that, those are some current numbers for you in terms of the use of the CARES Act funds. And now I wanna hand it over to Jason and he's gonna give a quick update on the modified hunker down um, emergency um, order that has currently happened and so some of the sort of background and information of why that happened. Jason, do you want to, to take it over? Sure, happy to. Thanks, thanks, Cameron. Um, um, as as Cameron mentioned, um, the uh, new emergency order sixteen um, went into effect uh, yesterday and um, is uh, slated to uh, be in effect until eight a.m. on January first, twenty twenty one. I think as um, we have uh, tried to provide quite a few updates during uh, the assembly meetings over the last couple of weeks, um, and, and I think as many people will know, we have seen just a, a massive increase in the number of cases that we are seeing every single day. Our uh, positivity rate has um, uh, climbed over 10%, uh, which is uh, 
uh, a number that is um, quite scary for those in the health field that work at the hospital and for our, our, our health department. It makes it almost impossible to do any type of real contact tracing. So um, as a result of all that, um, emergency order 16 was um, uh, put into uh, effect and it does uh, put some restrictions on a number of um, uh, locations and, and uh, businesses. I will say that um, uh, you know there are uh, public transportation, healthcare, child care facilities are all um, still operate, operational. Um, uh, retail stores, um, uh, gyms, uh, and, and personal kind of care services, uh, hair salons, nail salons, things like that are, um, do have a reduced occupancy. Um, and then obviously the uh, restaurants and bars are all closed for uh, indoor dining for the entire month. Um, but uh, outdoor dining as well as uh, takeout and delivery are still allowed at, at each of those places. Um, church services, worship services, uh, political gatherings such as the assembly meeting and others, uh, we actually made no changes to that. So, um, you know, they are still allowed to operate at 50% of their uh, fire code capacity. Um, some of the places that, um, some of the other places that are actually closed are some of the entertainment facilities. So movie theaters, bingo halls, bowling alleys, um, and, and other indoor um, uh, sports competitions. Uh, the one thing that I will uh, mention is uh, I think everyone uh, understands uh, the, the huge economic impact that this uh, has had on the community and will continue to have on the community. And uh, the one thing that I know Cameron did not mention um, is there will be a special assembly meeting on Friday. Um, the administration, along with um, uh, many of the assembly members, um, are going to be reappropriating uh, $15 million of the CARES Act um, uh, to put back into uh, some of the programs that, that Cameron mentioned, uh, both the uh, rental and mortgage assistance program, along with um, uh, small business grants and um, some additional funding for the, the voucher program that uh, Cameron mentioned that will provide uh, uh, $200 or $400 gift cards to uh, low-income families. And there's also a uh, program that we are in partnership with the Alaska Hospitality Retailers and United Way. Um, it's a meals program where we have partnered with uh, different restaurants throughout the community uh, to provide meals for, um, again, low-income residents. Um, the, the way that we were able to uh, find an additional $15 million in the CARES Act is when we originally passed the, the CARES Act, we had set aside $12 million um, for what is typically uh, known as the 25% local FEMA match for all of our FEMA expenses. Historically, for any uh, disaster, the state covered that local 25% match, but when we passed the uh, overarching CARES Act um, uh, appropriation, we weren't sure if the state was going to do that. We have now received word from the state that they are going to pay the communities uh, around the state's 25% match. So. We no longer have the need to set that aside for that um, uh, particular um, uh, spend. And then there was also $3 million that was set aside um, for um, uh, building out um, some mental health first responders to allow um, for uh, mental health professionals to respond to uh, certain calls instead of the police department being the first on scene. Um, but for those that have followed the passage of the 2021 budget, uh, both the administration and the assembly uh, agreed that we were going to use a portion of the, the newly uh, passed uh, alcohol tax uh, funds next year to pay for so, uh, pay for those costs so we no longer have to use that. So that is where we got the 15 million. Um, this is really the last $15 million that uh, is not 
uh, either already spent or uh, has been set aside for a specific purpose. Uh, and as Cameron said, and just to reiterate, this is not new money. This is our, this is part of the legislatively approved uh, money that uh, you know we we were uh, uh, given um, uh, back in in June. So, with that, happy to answer any questions. Um, I will uh, include a couple of links. We just put up an FAQ page for the emergency order um, that that has some frequently asked questions. I'll be happy to post that in the in the chat. Um, but again, happy to answer any questions as well. Uh, I've got a question. Thank you. I'm, I'm right, going to, yeah. yeah, no worries. Keep I'm going. going to try to direct it so that we can keep it moving well. Okay. So uh, we've got George Witchers, Amber, and then Tawny, and then we can go to Jared, but we really only have a couple minutes for each question so that we can keep things moving. George, do you have a question you'd like to ask uh, either Cameron or Jason? No. 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 Okay, thanks. Amber? We'll go to you. Yeah, I mean, sure, I have some questions. Um, $400 voucher that you have to apply for, you really think that's gonna help all the servers and bartenders and bussers and um, all the cooks and the dishwashers that have been laid off? Um, I, I, I hope you can hear me. So yeah, I've been reaching out and not getting much response at all. And I've been working at Simon & Seaforts for 11 years. And my restaurant is suffering. My people um, who just got laid off for four weeks have no idea how they're gonna pay their bills this month, let alone make up for Christmas presents and um, taking care of their kids, et cetera. So $400 voucher that you have to apply for is a pretty big slap in the face. I'm getting the impression that the assembly does not care about the white collar, excuse me, the blue collar or the uh, essential worker at all because $400 isn't gonna, and then we have to apply for it. So it, it, it feels, I mean, I'm so happy that you're helping people um, and I could apply for this $400 because I'm on unemployment right now, but that feels like a really big slap in the face. A lot of us wanna go to work and people who don't wanna go out to restaurants don't have to go out to restaurants. The restaurants um, are being singled out and that's not okay. If you can work side by side with another cashier at Cars or Fred Meyer for eight hour shifts, you are in close contact. Um, people go in and out of a restaurant within an hour or two. So if you can sit on an airplane in close contact for three or four hours, I'm pretty sure restaurants are not the problem. And um, I'd like to know how you're gonna fix this. Thanks, Amber. This is Jason or Cameron wanna respond? You know, I, I don't have a, a, a response except that I, I, um, um, I, I hear you and I, and I, this is what I've been doing for the last few months is talking to people who have the same concerns. I've emailed you so many times you've never emailed me back. So um, that's a lie. Also, um, if you could email me back, I'd really, really appreciate it because I know two people, I have a friend who killed himself on Thanksgiving. I have another friend, Corey, who hung himself over the summer, also a restaurant worker. I listened to the testimonies from the kids in high school on the school board meeting last night. They are begging to go back to school and they have friends who are talking about committing suicide and or have committed suicide. I know of seven suicides amongst people in my circle. So, so can we start comparing those numbers? Because this isn't right. So Amber, I'm happy to talk with you. I'm I'm happy to to just instead of a time to talk up with you as soon as you, you can. Um, and I'm That's sorry. That's great. I've left you my phone number. You've never called or reached out. Boy, I'm 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 sorry about, about that. I I I don't recall getting that. So um, I'll thank be you honest. for your apology. I'll I'll email you again tonight so you know who I am again. I would appreciate mm -hmm. that, and I, and I know who Thanks. you are. Um, oh, good. I'm happy I'm happy to talk to talk with you about it. So Thanks. Thank you. Connie? Yeah, so I, I don't know. So my question is to the point of my understanding is that the assembly and the local, our local government is, are doing as much as they can within the confines of the current CARES Act funding that they've received and that the funding that we have on a municipal level. Um, 
can you touch on what you guys are doing to reach out on the statewide level and then on the federal the federal level because it seems like that's where um the funding is really kind of stopped is is on a higher level and um it would be helpful maybe for folks to hear what's what's being done or what we can do yeah and i, I appreciate you saying that and we have a number of representatives on the call to, to today and it would be great to hear from from them on that as well thanks mm -hmm. Thank you. There are uh, quite a few just, comments in the chat I, as well. Sorry. I'll just add to the, Lindsay, if oh, I could just add ahead. to that, you know, I, I don't know how much more, you know, our state uh, officials can do either. I mean, I think they're kind of in the same boat as, as a lot of communities. I mean, I think they have done their job in terms of approving, you know, the $1.25 billion that we've received and pushed that out. Um, and it, I, you know, personally, I don't think this is necessarily an issue of our specific congressional delegation. I will say that they have been great uh, anytime that uh, we have needed anything, that we have needed uh, help with um, uh, technical assistance or, or, or those types of things. They have been wonderful, uh, but unfortunately, they are only three of 435. I am very pleased that, you know, um, Senator Murkowski has, has uh, kind of, uh, you know, joined a bipartisan group of uh, members of Congress and proposed, um, uh, you know, a, a second relief package that, um, you know, has quite a bit of funding that would be uh, both dedicated to uh, businesses in the form of additional PPP loans and uh, even additional kind of uh, funding that, uh, the, the state and local governments have received. Um, in the CARES Act, it was $150 billion that was split among the states and distributed to local governments. In this package, it's $160 billion. So it's even more that is uh, being proposed. So our hope is that here in the next 10 days, um, you know, Congress can, can really come together and, and pass this package because I think it's, it's hugely necessary. And as, as you mentioned, you know, the federal government is the only kind of uh, government between the, the state feds and, and local that can uh, uh, help with the size and the scope of, of the problem that uh, not just Anchorage or Alaska is facing, but this is something that every single community across the country is, is experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jason. Because I think we will talk about this when we get to our state legislators, I'm going to move us forward to the other reports and we'll capture the questions and comments. Um, and if folks can also respond to any of the questions in the chat, please do as we go forward. I'm not seeing our school board representative, though, is Star Marset on our call. Okay, then I'll move us ahead into the airport report. I know John Johansson is here and I could share my screen and I imagine John, your report will be very brief. <laughs> so, yes. um, thank you. It, it will be very brief. I hope you can hear me well. I've been having problems with uh, my um, audio on Zoom, but yeah, thanks for putting that uh, airport report on, on the screen. There's really not much to talk to talk about. Uh, you know, we're still battling with coronavirus issues. We're, we're doing what we can to make the airport terminal as safe as we can. Um, but just like, like everybody, we're, you know, we're, we're struggling with that. Um, Lake Hood Seaplane Base um, is iced over. Uh, people are using the lake. It is an aerodrome. Please stay off the ice. Uh, it's, it's not a recreational area. Um, we get tagged by FAA if there's incidents where people are crossing the lake on foot um, for what they call an incursion. Uh, please use the cell phone parking lot if you're heading <clears throat> toward the airport from Jewel Lake Spinard Road on uh, West International. It's your first right that you come to where the Department of Transportation uh, Central Region Headquarters building is. Um, and we're still looking for a whole bunch of folks, uh, equipment operators, mechanics, uh, maintenance specialists, et cetera. So there's a link on this update uh, for um, anybody that might be interested in those jobs. And this whole update is on our website at anchorageairport.com. 
Uh, that's really all I have. If there's any comments or questions, I'll entertain them quickly. Thank you, John. I think the hands are raised for the raised discussion for the, of the community. I have or a does question Tony have for one? John. Yeah, I do. I had to get a COVID test at the airport. Uh, I want to say it was about two and a half weeks ago. And uh, when we went, what we noticed, or I could not find any hand sanitizer stations from, so I went from the parking lot um, the and then across lot. to obviously where they're doing testing in the baggage area. And it, it, it felt a little weird uh, to not see any hand sanitizer stations. Is that normal? Was, were they just not there? Are you guys making any changes or decisions? We, we do have hand sanitizer stations. I don't know if there's any in that particular area. I'll uh, check into that and uh, see if we can get some put there. Okay, yeah. Great, thank you. And I'm also trying to look on our list if we have Sergeant Bichu joining us tonight. Are you here, Sergeant? Or someone with the Anchorage Police Department? Okay, the, they'll try to, they try to make our meetings when they have someone available, so they might not be able to come tonight. I know that he, uh, Sergeant Bishu was planning on it. So we'll move forward and we'll, we'll go back into talking about legislative session updates. And of course, top of mind are um, not only other state issues and priorities, but really how the pandemic is impacting everyone and, and what our state legislators can do about this. So. Um, We've invited all six and I believe everyone is here. So we'll, since we've talked with uh, Senator Gray Jackson, I'm hoping we can move on to Senator Mia Costello. Are you here tonight? Uh, hi, Lindsay. I work for Senator Costello. Um, and I was actually wondering if it's all right with you. She was gonna try and make the meeting. Uh, would it be possible to let the other legislators go first? And if she's not on, I can make a few comments at the end. Absolutely. After the mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That sounds great. All right, so then we'll go to Senator Natasha Van Imhoff. I know I saw you on here. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, so it good discussion so far. Um, a lot of um, A lot of talk about COVID. It is still on everybody's mind. Uh, asking about the legislative session, what's happening now is both the House and the Senate are trying to organize. Uh, that has not happened yet. Um, it is still trying, we're still having talks and I'm hopeful that will happen soon. Um, once that happens, we pick a leadership team, we pick people who's going to chair the various committees and so forth. In addition, we we're talking to Ledge Council about how to get down to Juno. Um, you saw the Baranoff Hotel is closed. Um, we did pay, uh, we did hire a company called Beacon to help us with the testing. We're going to bring the, um, at, as of now, legislators and staff down to Juneau and come up with a rigorous testing plan and isolation plan and so forth um, for uh, legislators down in the Capitol. I think the Capitol is probably going to be closed to most other people. Um, and then from there, I, I mean, I, I, we're going to try to see where it goes from there. Um, that's really all I can say. One of the things that we're going to try to do, though, is pass legislation early on that we can, um, let's see, uh, vote or operate remotely. So in the event that we need to retreat to our home bases, we can work at the LIO and do it that way. And I think that we've um, invested about a million dollars or so, like in the last 12 months, on cameras and audio equipment in I want to say like nine different locations, catch can all the way to Utiagvik. So um, we're trying to get that uh, up in line as well. Um, in terms of priorities, I think we're sort of waiting for the governor's budget to see what it's going to look like. We're also waiting for the fall revenue forecast to adjust the numbers to see what kind of revenue we have. Um, I think one of the biggest conversations is that we're probably going to have a big supplemental due to the Medicaid um, uh, people being in the hospital and, and seeking medical treatment in addition to medevacs from outlying areas into Fairbanks, Juneau, and uh, Anchorage. Um, so we're, I was trying to talk to Ann Zink today to try to ask her a little bit about kind of what's going on um, in terms of the money and what's left over. Um, there is some funds left over, but a lot of it will be spent, I think, this month. And then I think we're, we're trying to chase it as well we the legislators um, of where the different funds have gone and the different buckets. Um, 
I, I think that's a lot of moving parts right now. And that's kind of where we're, we're trying to um, see where things fall into place over the next 30 days. So I can go look at the chat here or um, Lindsay, if you want to let me know. Yeah, thank you. Would you be able to stay on and we could take questions at the end? Um, yeah, yeah, I can. Okay. okay. I think that'll help keep us moving. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Representative Harriet Drummond. Thank you. It's uh, great to see you all tonight. Um, I thought it was interesting that Senator Gray Jackson said she'd never seen as many as 40 people at a community council meeting. Um, I'm a member of the North Star Community Council and several years ago, we had over 60 people in one meeting, we filled that elementary school's library. I don't re quite recall what the issues were, but there were at least two um, very important neighborhood issues on the on the agenda. And it was great to have that kind of a turnout in the smallest community council in town. Um, like, uh, like Senator Von Imhoff and Senator Gray Jackson and uh, Representative Chris Tuck and Representative Matt Clayman, I'm preparing to uh, go to Juneau. Um, I, my target is, as others have said, get the budget done, work on revenue bills, um, uh, it CARES, if there's going to be new CARES Act funding, um, that will be our job to uh, make sure that that's legally appropriated and um, uh, uh, funneled through the various departments in the state that will get it down to the level of the of the uh, families and businesses that need to benefit um, from that. Um, right now, I'm not sure what the governor's uh, plans are. He has um, instituted a, a second um, emergency um, resolution um, or I'm, I'm, I, excuse me, whatever the governor calls his proclamation, um, based on upon the fact that last spring's proclamation was in anticipation of the pandemic. Now we are in the pandemic, so he considers it a new emergency declaration, but that expires on December 15th, and I'm not quite sure what's going to happen after that point. Um, hopefully we'll be working on um, accepting vaccines, um, and working on that distribution plan. So maybe the next governor's um, proclamation will be for the vaccine uh, stage of the game. And uh, once again, that third emergency proclamation, should the legislature not get involved, will expire on January 15th, about five days before the, the next legislature convenes. Now, none of your... Um, None of your representatives changed in this election. Uh, we either got reelected or we weren't up for um, um, election like um, uh, Senator Costello and Senator Gray Jackson are in the other, they're in the other um, uh, time frame for uh, Senate races. Um, but again, we are waiting to get organized. Uh, we're on the House side, we're waiting to see uh, if there is a recount in the um, Lance Pruitt, Liz Snyder race. Um, traditionally, that those have not changed uh, with that much of a gap um, in the recounts that have happened in the past. Um, and depending on how that turns out, will guide us in how we're going to how how we're going to organize in the House. Um, if I was Queen, I wouldn't allow any personal bills. Um, we finished the budget in 68 days last spring. Um, uh, this is this this one is my eighth year in the legislature and my first year it took us five or six weeks just to get the budget subcommittee work done in which every legislator participates in that process and then the budget subcommittees submit their recommendations to the finance committees on uh, on each side of the legislature and then from there the budgets are crafted with recommendations from budget subcommittees we finished that work in three weeks last spring. And I said to myself, wow, if we can do this on a regular basis, um, we, don't, we don't need to be dragging our feet and going into special session. Um, however, there's a lot of freshmen. There's a, something on the order of 13 or 14 brand new members of the legislature out of 60 that will have to be brought up to speed um, and um, learn, learn, how, learn how things work and, uh, in order to uh, get the, the um, uh, the laws passed that we need to um, to serve Alaska, and uh, also housekeeping bills like um, operations, health issues. The, uh, I heard today that uh, pharmacists need to be authorized to um, 
uh, administer the, the, the COVID vaccines that we will be getting. Uh, there's going to have to be, obviously, in Alaska, hundreds of thousands of those vaccines administered, and we need all the healthcare professionals that we can to get involved in that process. But the, there, have, there have to be some laws changed in order to uh, allow the pharmacists to include that within their scope of services. Um, so that's, that's, that's my report, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Great. Thank you, Representative Drummond. We'll go to the next two representatives, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, so thanks for joining us, Representative Matt Clayman. I'll turn it over to you next. Thanks, Lindsay, and thank you all for having me. I want to apologize for not getting the live photo, but I've been, I mean, my internet service seems to be sort of spotty, and I've been on three Zoom calls, and every time they tell me, stop the photos. <laughs> so that's why you don't get to see my, my live image. Uh, these are really super challenging times. COVID has really changed the landscape in terms of our state's economy, our local economy, and, and I'm acutely aware of that in my service to the service to the community and my work in the legislature. I think one of the, the big issue that we're really going to have to confront this year when we get to Juno, in addition to figuring out a way to meet safely and be able to communicate with, with our constituents and, and meet in committees and figure out how to do that safely, whether that means a lot of remote meetings or whether we figure out a way to potentially meet from, from our home districts and come to the legislative information offices. I, I think that's, that's very much a work in progress, but the, the biggest issue that I think we're going to face as a state is the budget, and the biggest issue in the budget is how we're going to man, how we're going to deal with the dividend, because right now, today, when you start looking at the economic damage that's been caused by COVID and response to COVID, and you look at the really bottom line, the state's balance sheets, we really don't have money to pay a dividend. And if we're going to try to grow the economy back and we start trying to figure out ways to do that, we're going to have to find a way not only to manage our budget so that we can invest in growing the economy and invest in people and people's jobs and figure out ways to grow those jobs, but we're also going to have to figure out a way to, to assist those who are very much in need who may not be able to work and may have more limited work opportunities. How do we basically regrow our economy? Because Alaska's economy has taken a dramatic hits. We just look at Southeast at the tour industry, the lack of cruise ships. We talk to business owners in Turnigan, turning business owners in Spinard, Sand Lake. We see how they've all suffered. I mean, certain some businesses are doing okay, but many are really struggling. Many of the people that work in those businesses are struggling. And if we don't figure out a way to bring the economy back, then, then all the work in, that we're going to do in the legislature is going to get harder and harder as we go forward. So that's kind of my I, my big picture perspective, I really second all the things that I've heard from the other legislators. Uh, we're, we're working hard on figuring out a good organization. I've been proud for the last four years to be part of a tripartisan organization in the House that had a group of Republicans, independents, and Democrats. Part of the strength of that coalition was we actually knew what issues we just had to set aside and focus on what's best for the state. And when we look at both the COVID issues and the budget issues, that's, what's, that's what I think is going to be asked of every legislator to put Alaska first, put our common interests first, and put party partisanship aside. And I've been pleased to do that for the last four years and been optim optimistic that we'll figure out a way to have a similar tripartisan coalition in the House going forward. And I'll certainly stay online to take questions. Great, thank you. And uh, Chris Tuck, you've been on since we chit-chatted before the meeting. Um, you're not last or least. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. I went through two batteries on that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Representative Chris Tuck, been serving South Central Anchorage here for over 10 years. Um, it is going to be a tough year. It's going to be a very tough year. We have so many freshmen coming into the house and it's going to be an education for them um, as well as uh, we got to build relationships fast because Alaskans really need it and really demanding it. We are in a, in a crisis. Um, and I'm hoping that when we get down to Juneau that we, that we do try to limit as, as uh, Representative Hunt Drummond pointed out that, uh, you know, we got our work done pretty quick last year. I don't see why we need to go any longer than 75 days, especially with uh, um, trying to keep the capital safe. And I think that we do those 75 days straight. I don't think anyone should be flying home over the weekend. We just go down, hunker down, get our work done. If we're gonna close that building off to the public, 
then we need to make sure that we're there doing our work and um, making sure we have gavel to gavel running smooth so people can at least monitor and watch. And that way we can move, meet in the committee rooms. The committee rooms, we can spread out wide enough so legislators can meet. And uh, since the public's not gonna be there and uh, have the proper coverage. And, uh, but uh, I think we need to focus on a few things. Of course, uh, the CARES Act money, we are gonna see a second round. And we need to make sure as a legislature that we appropriate the money this time rather than letting the money go through Dunleavy and use a improper process to the revised program uh, legislative receipt process of the LBNA committee. And, um, and to do that, uh, we're gonna have to have a vision on what we wanna see happen with that CARES Act money. Our, our public education is hurting right now. We're, we're gonna be losing a lot of students and, and losing opportunity. Um, that it's going to be very difficult to make up if we don't uh, continue making education effective. And um, we're going to have to take care of small businesses. We're going to have to take care of, uh, of those who uh, um, need assistance in, in, in many ways. And there's been all sorts of fantastic ideas that have been floated around. I'll tell you, one of the, one of the best programs that we had out there was the, the uh, 10 million that went to Alaska Housing and Finance for their homelessness program, where we were able to give um, not only not only rental assistance, but mortgage assistance as well, assistance to people. And that really trickles up and that really hits people at home because that there, you know, if we're not able to do a dividend and give individual relief to Alaskans, at least we can do household relief through the CARES Act money. And uh, so I'm really glad that to see the municipality, municipality of Anchorage taking that on as well, because that that I think is very successful. That helps people stay in their homes and helps them make it through, the, especially this holiday season. Um, some of the priorities that I have this year is I really, it is about making the legislature a little bit more um, effective. Um, I do think that we need to pass a, some sort of continuity of governance bill. So in case we do have a natural disaster, a pandemic, a terrorist attack, or something that goes on to where the legislature can't meet, we can still function as a legislature. Many states already have it, especially your civil rights, I mean, your civil war states that were um, that had fought the Civil War because they passed legislation way back then so they can function this way. Um, I really don't want to see any excuses for, not, for us not to do our work. And if we do get out in 75 days this year, I would like us not to reset, uh, only recess, not to adjourn. So if we have to return back to Juno to modify or to implement um, programs to help Alaskans through this, I really think it's our duty. If uh, grocery store clerks and uh, um, nurses and teachers can be working. There's no reason why the legislature shouldn't be working. Um, so, so some of those um, plans right there to try to keep the legislature going, uh, making sure that we have, um, um, make sure that we have our administrative uh, service directors that, that really help our budget directors. Um, they're actually the budget directors for our commissioners, trying to put them back underneath the commissioners rather than underneath the uh, uh, Office of uh, Man Budget Management. Um, and then um, elections. Uh, we just had election this year. I've had elections bill in for the last uh, probably eight um, sessions. And um, I want to go back to you know what I've done before as a permanent absentee. Once you vote absentee, you can always vote absentee until you miss an election. And then if you miss an election, you have to reapply. That really helps out our seniors. It helps out our special needs adults that are that are trying to vote. And it really helps out rural Alaska. Many places in rural Alaska, they simply do not have um, polling places. They can only vote by mail. Why require them to fill out an application every year when we just make it automatic until they miss an election? Um, and then uh, of course, uh, we have to have some sort of ballot um, curing. So right now, if you make a mistake on your ballot, there's no way of fixing that ballot before election day or before that ballot's counted. Other states has that, so if there is a there is a, a mistake, or if there's a, a, a missing detail, or if something's not clear, you can get a hold of that voter, and uh, they can fix that ballot. So that way, their vote actually counts. Um, I also want to see us do something on, more on pre-K with the Alaska Reads Act, and I also uh, agree with L.B. Gray Jackson that we should constitutionalize the PFD, do a 50-50 split, put it to the vote of the people so that we could be done with this once and for all and really have a structure in place that uh, Alaskans can rely on and the legislature can rely on for uh, funding our budgets. And then last, I would like to uh, say that uh, I do think it's important that we keep continue working on defined benefits for um, our, our um, public workers. And, uh, um, you know, really we're having a hard time retaining and uh, recruiting. And this is one of the best ways that we can do that bang for buck and be able to give people 
um, certainty so that when they retire, they know they can retire with dignity and not be a burden on society. So I didn't want to take up too much time. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you. That last comment got a bit of yes in the chat. Um, I'm looking at our uh, participant list. I'm not seeing uh, Senator Costello, so I will turn it over to Katie to share an update. And if she joins, she'll, she'll have some time too. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, just a couple of quick comments. Uh, sorry, Senator Costello couldn't be here. She's been really busy caring for an elderly family friend that's been sick, um, but she wanted to be here. So sorry about that. Uh, she did want me to share just a couple of things and uh, uh, kind of reiterates a lot of what we've already heard. Uh, she's looking forward to seeing the governor's budget, uh, which will come out mid-December. Uh, the other thing is legislative council has been uh, putting together these guidelines um, to deal with COVID. Right now they're saying that the Capitol building will be closed to the public. Uh, and she just wanted me to let everyone know that she'll be happy to set up a phone call or a Zoom meeting with anyone that would like to get in touch with her. Uh, and then one thing that she is gonna be looking at, which Senator Gray Jackson mentioned is also looking at uh, revising the dividend formula. So that's all I've got for you, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And so if folks have questions, if you wanna direct it to a specific legislator, that'll help out. Um, but it looks like I've got Roy Witchers, Tani Sakariccia, and I think Jared, you probably wanna ask a question too. Okay, in that order. And then if others want to, you could raise hand, you could wave, you could put it in the chat. We'll, we'll try to get through. We have, um, we're in good shape. We have 15 or so minutes. Roy, would you like to ask a question? Um, more a partial statement. I'd say that uh, I'm, a, I'm almost 65 and I have never been so disappointed in how government is reacting to things. Lockdowns are the worst thing you could have ever done. And you've, now you're doing it twice. And during the most important holiday season for the economy, for small businesses, and of course, the ones that are allowed called essential. But small businesses, man, this is the basis of our whole economy. Um, and the same thing with the schools. Instead of letting the kids go to school, you keep that locked down. And there is almost no risk in that for the children. And that's verified over and over. Um, I mean, I hate to say it, but we have a lack of people. And this is why Donald Trump got elected, because he's a businessman. He doesn't play with our money like it's, it's your money. That's how you guys in the Senate and the legislature, the assembly, all of you play with our money. And that 150 million was our money. We will all pay that some way. And I've seen this going on for a long time. And this is the worst I've ever seen government. It's not reacting to the people in any positive way. It's the worst time of year. This is when the economy of most businesses explode. And this gets them through all those lean months of the winter to spring and hopefully get some business. But I, I'm, I'm worried that you guys next are going to say, oh, the vaccine's here, mandatory vaccine. That's what I'm hearing coming. And that really disappoints me because that should not be something, a government that's based on freedom, liberty, and real justice you're not showing that either. You're secluding mm -hmm. people, excluding them from their own government in a lot of ways. And it's been going on for almost a year now. We're coming up to a year. I mean, I'm, I'm well, still, I've been here right. a long time. Wait one second. There's I'm just gonna give issue. you one more second, okay? Okay, well, this is about the capital. We should have moved that thing a long time ago. And we have tried, but the legislature always played games with us. I've watched this state for almost 50 years go through this stuff. And all I see is government collusion to get business. And then you were always in part of it, something. And that's what that voucher thing is all about. You should give us our money, our dividends. 
that should have been what we had coming for the holiday year. I mean, this is what would spread okay, out the whole economy. Oh, Roy, I want to I want to make sure that we we have conversation okay, and discussion. Ahead. Ahead. Thanks, thank, thank, you. thank you though. Thanks for your I've comments and for joining. Across. I think so. Thank you. And we'll go to Tani and then Jared next. Uh, yeah, mine will be pretty quick. I just wanted to kind of balance out some of what I'm hearing and thank um, our legislators and assembly folks for um, prioritizing the health and well-being of our community. I know. Um, it's really, really hard for everybody right now. And the fact that we are in a shutdown absolutely breaks my heart and I hate it. And I hate that people are suffering and are hurting themselves and hurting others. And I, I really am looking forward to being on the other side like many of you, but I also wanna say that I'm grateful to have a community um, that wants to see everybody around and not just this, you know, the people who made it out because they have better um, health. Uh, and yeah, just, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not being more clear, but I just wanted to say thank you. Okay, thank you, Tony. Then we'll go to Jared. Hey, thanks, Lindsay. Hey, um, I've just, uh, there's a lot of people here, a lot of representatives. I think there's a couple uh, mayor candidates um, and I'll try to be quick. Um, so, um, I, I recently I've, I've talked to a lot of medical staff, um, a lot of people that know medical staff, a lot of people that have worked in the hospitals. I just called John Whittleton. I, I own a property on the South side of Anchorage. And uh, uh, John Whittleton, I spoke to him two days ago on the phone uh, after EO 16 came out. And, and I just, uh, I, I couldn't believe that we were shutting down businesses during the holidays. And when we waited a week, until November 1st, so that the four week span uh, covered the entire month of December. And um, I, I know everybody's got different opinions about um, the virus and what's going on and all that stuff. But um, after talking with John and everybody else, I mean, John was very clear that the, the issue is not overrunning the hospitals. They're not overworked. They're not, there's not an abundance of, I'd have to find the names, but I, I, I I listened to the first meeting with uh, Austin Quinn Davidson um, that she had with the CEO of uh, or the chief of uh, Providence Hospital. And she said, we have plenty of capacity. That's not an issue. We have surge capacity we haven't even used yet. I, I listened to, um, I think his name is Jared Cawson or something. He's the uh, Alaska State Hospital and Nursing Home Association that said, we probably had more people in ICU last year than we did this year. And, and that's, that's on uh, Dunleavy's page. Um, you can still look it up and see it today. So um, uh, John Weldon reiterated that the issue was never capacity. It was never um, cases. It was staffing. So uh, we do know that the hospitals uh, furloughed without pay a lot of staff during the summer. Um, you know, we do know a lot of people left because there wasn't PPE available to some of the nurses. Um, I, I talked to a guy the other day said I worked in ICU for for six years and there was plenty of times that there was more people than than, than we could take at the moment so it's nothing new um, it, it, so so you know the the why we're shutting down our economy during the holidays is is clear that it's the hospitals are unable to staff uh, their facilities and and I just um, and in closing, I asked Felix, I said, I asked Felix about it, uh, Rivera. I asked Meg about it on Facebook. I asked uh, John Weddleton multiple times on the phone. None of them have went through the hospitals and seen this for themselves. None of them have uh, uh, verified what our staffing levels are today versus last year or the year before. None of them have asked what our capacity levels are today compared to what they were last year or the year before. Um, they don't have any of the info. So... Um, I left a, mayor, a message with Austin Quinn Davidson, you know, what are our uh, uh, staffing levels today compared to last year and previous years? And I haven't heard anything back. Nobody knows. Um, why isn't more pressure being put on the hospitals to get staff? I mean, they made a billion dollars record profits in the last quarter, and they're telling us they can't get staff to staff their hospitals. You know, so I'll close. I'll leave it at that. I, I just, all the representatives are here. There's mayor candidates. There's all of us. What You know, 
And, and lastly, give me 30 seconds. Uh, Bradley House is right seconds. around the corner from me. Bradley House is right around the corner from me. They've been taking temperatures for four or five months. They've got a list every time I go in there. They've got half their restaurant they can't fill. They've got walls built up in between their booths. A CD, a code enforcement officer came in there last three weeks ago and said, I got a report and I came in here and I can't even find something to complain about. He said, you guys are doing a great job. And he left. And you know what? They just got shut down because of EO 16. They just got shut down. You know, and that's, you know, the, the hospitals need to get their staff up. That's not an excuse to shut our cities down. And we can't put a blanket EO-16 across every restaurant in the city when some of them are doing everything they can, never had a case traced to them, and, and they're still subject to this EO-16. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jared. I think Representative Drummond may want to respond to some some of that, you know, from the state perspective or or comment. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Um, just a couple of comments um, from the gentleman that spoke before um, Jared. You know, hindsight is really simple. I think if Alaska had had some leadership displayed in the governor's office and we had properly shut down in the spring the way other states did, the way Hawaii did, if you go look at the, at the map on the number of cases in Hawaii, they tamped it way down. They are inviting visitors back. Their businesses are going to be okay. Alaska had a similar opportunity, which we completely missed the boat on in terms of limiting um, limiting access into our state of people that brought COVID to our state. It didn't start here. It came from um, uh, a, a, a cargo jet pilot was the first one from China who uh, brought COVID into into our state. But we can't we can't backtrack and. Uh, do that now. So we're going to have to do the best we can as we are. In terms of hospital staffing, there are so many sick healthcare workers that staffing the number of beds that we have, we do have the number of beds available, but beds don't do you any good if you don't have sufficient hospital staff. And um, uh, Alaska relies why can't they, why can't they get on staffing? traveling nurses. Excuse me, let me finish my statement. Um, Alaska relies a lot on traveling nurses and, and doctors and other healthcare workers. And there are way fewer of those available who might even want to come here because they're already in, in great demand in the lower 48, which is also having crisis uh, capacity issues in their hospitals. So, you know, we're on our own up here. We can't, we can't send our, our sick people to the next big city because we're it. We're not going to be sending people to Seattle if Seattle is, um, uh, is uh, shut down. And there are huge issues in rural Alaska uh, who don't have any um, ICU beds. Uh, people are dying in remote communities in Alaska because they're unable to get medevaced out because of weather and because there aren't um, ICU beds available in the, in the big city hospitals in Fairbanks and Anchorage. So it's, um, we're, we're in a tough spot and it isn't going to get any better. Um, it would have been great to shut everything down in the spring so that we would have been able to send kids back to school. I'm really concerned about the, um, the education that our, our youngest kids are getting because kindergartners can't learn to read on Zoom. Sorry, folks, that just doesn't work. Um, high school kids and middle school kids are doing okay, but it would be much better to have them all back in, and I agree. But when you have staff that is... Um, um, uh, is at risk of, of catching COVID because of their age or comorbidities, um, sending the kids to school and then getting staff sick or having kids carry the disease to, to staff and then take it home to their families, you're gonna have even more problems. But again, that's not a decision that the, that the legislature can make. Um, it's, a, it's an individual school district decision. And I'm sorry, you don't have a school board member present tonight who can speak to that. Um, I know there are some changes uh, being proposed by the superintendent, but it all depends on community spread and what that mm -hmm. looks like. Thank you, Representative. I also saw Senator Von Himmelhoff wanted to weigh in as well. Thank you. So the two, I appreciate the dialogue. Um, I actually talked to an ICU doctor last night, a pulmonary ICU doctor, and I talked to Ann Zink at length today. So the takeaways are, um, we have two big immediate issues right now. We have pressure in our hospitals and we are closing certain businesses in the next month. We isn't just Anchorage. Um, and Zinc basically says the community spread right now 
is not in restaurants per se or isolated in one particular area. The culprits are, if someone feels sick and only has minor symptoms, they brush it off and they continue on their life. And then they infect one person, one person, one person, one person for the next 10 days while they're still contagious. Not really maliciously, but it's just, that's just basically what happens. And that's happening more and more because most people don't really feel sick or they have very minor, they think it's allergies or they think it's the cold weather and they just have some sniffles or a headache and they don't realize they're very contagious. Doesn't matter whether you're in a restaurant, doesn't matter whether you're, you know, cars, grocery, and you take your mask off, it doesn't matter. Anyway, you're playing cards with people at home, you're having dinner. That's the community spread right now that's happening, according to Anne, and that makes sense. Shutting down restaurants, I wholly disagree with. Other companies or other states, uh, cities like Ketchikan and Juno that Anne described have been doing it well. They have a dimmer switch. They go up, they go down, 75%, 50%, 25%, depending on any given time. They don't do an on or off and shut the whole thing down. I think our, our mayor and the assembly, no, no offense, guys, I think you're making the wrong decision. Um, the ICUs, what they're doing is they are uh, pretty full, guys exhausted. They've got a lot of people intubated, but they have plans for it. They're going to take, they're going to start doing some of the elective surgeries for a bit if they need to. Then they're going to take personnel that are normally would be your surgeon or whatnot, and he's going to work underneath one of the pulmonary guys. So they're going to have one pulmonary guy and look, and he's going to oversee four doctors. That's how they're going to get the staff. So there are plans in place. They can handle it. It's going to be tough. It's not sustainable, maybe another four weeks or so, but then they're all going to get kind of overwhelmed here. But closing down the restaurants, closing down the gyms, closing down, no, not right. I don't, I don't support that. I don't want to be on the record saying that I think that's a good idea because I don't agree. But I do think that people need to take personal responsibility that if you start feeling sick, stay at home because you are contagious. So that's just my two cents. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator. Now I'm going to go back to way back in the chat. There's a discussion, but uh, we had a couple people ask questions. Um, Paul Berger has a question for uh, Rep. Representative Clayman, I believe, and then Peggy Auth also had a question for our legislators. So I'm going to go there. We we maybe can go 10 more minutes, but then I'm going to have to move us on. So uh, Paul, we'll turn it over to you. I'm going to try to be very brief, Lindsay. Um, I'm, I'm talking to Matt first, but guys, background, I am a bar owner. Uh, we did have 16 employees at the start of all this. We went down to six. Now we're back to zero. Uh, we've had two suicides, one attempted suicide on Thursday, one marriage destroyed. I also am a landlord. I have 70 apartments. I'm in and out of these apartments every day. I'm dealing with tenants who can't pay their rent. It, it is, and it doesn't feel on the ground to us. Now, you guys are in the legislature, you're getting information. I'm not getting that. But when you walk around, I'm in Home Depot, I'm in people's houses, I'm doing stuff. I'm talking to people who have been sick. It, 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 and 116 deaths in Anchorage, but the, to the destruction of what's going on in my one little business. It, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, but back to Matt mentioned, uh, you're looking for ideas to get the economy going in Alaska. I got the simplest one for you. You don't need to overthink this. Let us go. Pull back regulations, open the economy up. As a bar owner, I just got hit with another 5% tax. We got to start paying in January. <clears throat> you're closing us for uh, December, uh, one of our biggest months. And then January and February, historically our dead months. If you guys can pull back, think less about the money you're getting from CARES, when you're going to move all this money around, do what you got to do with it. I get it. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of responsibility. But on the low end, on the, on the ground level, the more you can let us do what we do, the more we can produce. And the more we produce, the more we can give back into our the, – the economy helps the most vulnerable. So all these servers and staffers and dish people we've got – they're the ones hurting. They don't want to be home. They don't want a voucher. They don't want anything. They just want to work. That's all I want to say about that. Um, that's it for now. I wrote a little resolution up to uh, ask to repeal 16, but we'll talk about that at the end of the uh, at the end of the meeting, I believe, if, if at all. Thank, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Paul. So I'll just I, I'll try to answer. There was there was actually. A lot of questions in there. I, I would say first, with respect to the to the shutdown order in Anchorage, uh, I I have been consistently concerned when I've seen what's going on in other states about kind of a sometimes a cultural unwillingness to wear masks, a cultural unwillingness 
to socially distance that makes it even harder for, for folks like you to stay open. I was disappointed to see the mayor's decision to, to enter another hunker down order. It was, uh, I don't think it's simple, but I also know that's part of what the authority we give to municipalities as a state matter. It's one of these great battles. We, not battles, but one of the common discussions as well. If you don't like what your city city's doing, go to the state and get the legislature to take that power away from the city. And then once the city has the power, people start saying, well, did they use it the right way? And that's that's really the question to direct to the assembly folks and directly to the mayor. Uh, I would be at this point very, very reluctant to try to take away municipal powers. If anything, I'm, I've always been a fan of trying to give municipal governments and local governments more authority and make the state less of a kind of caretaker for those communities. Because I think the smaller communities, whether it's a, the largest city in Alaska like Anchorage or whether it's some of the small communities across Alaska, I think they do a better job of figuring out how to govern themselves than we can do from Juneau. So, so I'm not a fan of taking municipal power away. Uh, the second thing I'd say about CARES Act funding, I like to think that who's ever the governor has everything wired on a string and knows exactly how to do everything best. But what I keep discovering in my life is that getting more people involved and more people in the discussion is more likely to lead to solutions that work on a broad level, including getting the economy restarted. And I think where Governor Dunleavy really uh, failed terrifically during this year is with pandemic funding, instead of saying, how do I work with the legislature to get different ideas and figure out how to do this better? He pretty much said, well, just give me the authority and I'll take care of it. And a lot of that funding was, dis dis was dis uh, dispersed very poorly. And so what I'm optimistic, but given the history and given how little the governor has cooperated with the legislature during the entirety of his term, I, I have some optimism, but it's kind of guarded that the governor needs to work with the legislature because I'm not saying I have all the best ideas in the room, but if we don't get more ideas in the room and figure out what's actually gonna work to, to get this economy restarted safely, it's gonna be even harder to get it restarted. So I think in terms of CARES Act funding, the first step is for the governor to meaningfully engage with the legislature and the legislature to hold his feet to the fire to make sure that he in fact does cooperate with us and doesn't just kind of go his own way. So I'm not sure that totally answers the two qu the questions you've had because we had a lot. Well, just a quick follow-up and thank, thank you for that answer. And I'll, you know, no, that, that did. And I like the best government in my opinion is as close as possible to the governed. And I'm encouraged by this meeting to see how many people have showed up. We have two mayoral candidates on here, Mike Robbins and Dave Bronson. A lot of people asking tough questions and that, that's what we need is just to go back and forth and figure this out. So I appreciate your follow-up. Thank you very much. Great, thank you both. And I'm gonna turn it over to Peggy Auth. She had a question for other state legislators. Feels like a while ago because it was in the chat, but I'm trying to, to look at them both. Uh, yes. Um, for all of our state representatives, um, you know, we just did the census and then they do redistricting. And, and uh, I would like to see our state be more like some of the other states that have adopted, where it's just a, a board, a panel, it's nonpartisan, and it's not doing gerrymandering. It's, it's just a better way to do things. Um, it doesn't have these ridiculous boundaries where it, it chops you know, coastal Southeast Alaska cities going way up into, um, you know, Chugach outside of here, it's ridiculous. So I, I really, really hope that that's something you do because it's only something you can do every, you know, 10 years where we do the redistricting and it's really important to do it right. The, and, and, you know, the Spinar Community Council had even talked about doing a lawsuit back, I don't know, Tom, what was it, 20 years ago? Um, because you're supposed to recognize the districting by what is historic and what is more historic than the fact that Spinard was its own, it was its own town, it was recognized. And it's ridiculous. I'm sorry, I like all you legislators, but it's, we have, we're so chopped up. Look at all the names we have. I mean, if we, if we could just have um, one or two people that are in Juneau, fighting for Spinard. I think it's, it's, it addresses what Tom's talking about of why we are not getting represented the way we should because nobody is actually from Spinard representing Spinard. And it's a, it's a complaint 
I've been here almost 40 years and I've spent the entire time, uh, almost the entire time living in Spinard. And, it, and it's very frustrating that um, it doesn't matter if it's the assembly or the house or the Senate that we can't have representation from Spinard. So this is the Spinard Community Council meeting and I think it's a good time to bring up that we need true Spinard representation um, and, and I hope that maybe we could do a resolution or something about this, Lindsay, uh, you know, before the session starts, because I, I really think this is an ideal time to do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peggy. Tom McGrath was giving lots of emojis, so that was <laughs> nice to see. Um, I, I think Representative Drummond may want to respond, and if other legislators want to do that as well. And, and Lindsay, I'll respond as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. yes, thank, yes, you. thank you. Uh, thank, thanks, uh, Peggy. I appreciate your observation and also of others who said um, it'd be good if it was more nonpartisan. Unfortunately, we didn't change the rules in time for the redistricting board that has already been appointed. And um, the, um, uh, the governor and the, um, the leadership of the House and the Senate and the, and the state Supreme Court all have an input on who gets appointed to that board. And we think we have a pretty good uh, redistricting board appointed. The, the biggest problem is that 40% of the state's people are in Anchorage in a land area that's like less than, uh, it's a fraction of 1% of Alaska's land area. And all the rest of folks, the rural communities are losing uh, population to the more urban areas. Um, Matsu is growing tremendously. There are two Senate districts out there that should have 35,000 people in them. They're now in the 45,000 range. And it looks to me like with the next redistricting, Matsu may gain uh, one or two House seats and possibly a Senate seat or a half a Senate seat um, uh, because of the movement of the population. And then what happens is you have really huge uh, rural districts with a lot of land and very few people in them. But all of those House districts uh, with the last um, uh, redistricting 10 years ago, um, had to have approximately 17 and a half thousand people in them. And as those change, that's, that's where the changes are going to come. Um, and I totally agree with you. Spinard is wonderful, but it doesn't need three senators and three representatives. I've been very frustrated by that, especially since um, in the uh, community reactions part of the last redistricting that happened uh, in early the early uh, what, 2010 or 2012, um, there were folks who looked at it and said, oh, the community councils are all whole. Well, that was not true for Spinard, but I didn't find that out until I ran, uh, ran for the House seat in District 18. And um, House District 18, my district has the, the bulk of Spinard, but uh, Chris Tuck in 25, 24, 24, 23, thanks, Chris. And Matt Clayman in 21 also have small pieces of Spinard. Um, but all of the, all drawing the lines so that community council boundaries are represented is something we all need to push for with this next redistricting. So um, when they start going through their process after the census has reported their numbers, then let's start pushing them to. Um, uh, to do a more uh, community oriented, um, uh, community council oriented kind of division, at least in Anchorage and other cities in the, in the state that have community councils. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you, Representative Clayman. So I just wanted to note because Peggy raised a really good question about what would it take to change the redistricting board. It's actually in the Alaska Constitution. I'm a big fan of the Alaska Constitution. I actually think the, the people that drafted the Constitution were very far think, forward thinking. They, they, I think, foresaw some of the issues that we would have as a state that none of us could foresee. And, and the Constitution has served us incredibly well. Uh, on, a, on redistricting, I went to law school in Texas and we would learn, hear these stories about how the legislature does all the redistricting. And, and so if one, ha one party is in control of the, of the legislature, they heavily control how district lines look. And that's true in many states. And under the Alaska Constitution, it's, it's in Article, I believe it's in Article 6, Section 8 about the redistricting board. They specifically lay out that the governor appoints two, the president of the Senate appoints one, the, the, 
the Speaker of the House appoints one and the Chief Justice appoints one. And when they did that, I think their thinking was to try to make it as nonpartisan as possible. And when you look at the history of redistrict, redistricting in Alaska, it often ends up in the courts and the court often gets involved in kind of redrawing some of the districts or telling them they didn't quite get it right. And, and those court decisions actually influence how much the redistricting board does going forward. So I, while I appreciate some of the frustrations that we have, I also think the odds of changing that are incredibly low in the short term because to actually put a constitutional amendment on the ballot, you have to get a two thirds vote in the house and a two thirds vote in the Senate. And if you just look at the difficulty we're having organizing, I would say the odds that that changes anytime in the near future is actually pretty low. But, but, I, but I certainly think we'll, we'll want to look carefully because there's definitely demographic changes going on in Alaska and that's going to have impacts on Alaska on, on Anchorage as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, as the facilitator of this meeting, I'm, going, I'm doing a time check and I'm going to um, propose something that may not be very popular, but I would like to transition from this topic to uh, our in other invited guests with the planning department on another topic we have really important in Anchorage and, or in Spinard, and that's the homeless and transient shelter ordinance. Uh, and then I will uh, pull our traffic calming resolution from our agenda tonight and we'll push that into January so that we can have the presentation from the planning department and then move into the community discussion. So I'm, even though we have folks in the queue, I'm gonna hope that you'll, you'll give comments during the neighborhood and community announcements. And I'm gonna go ahead and thank our state legislators for joining us. Uh, we don't have you join every month because we could talk for hours, um, but we appreciate the updates that you provide in written form and then inviting you at key moments is really important for us. Um, so thank you all for the conversation and questions. And what I'm going to do is uh, introduce Frances McLaughlin, who will be joining us from, uh, she's uh, as a senior planner uh, with the municipality to discuss a proposed ordinance for uh, Anchorage. And it's something that our council is interested in and uh, is impacted by. So I uh, wanna make sure that we cover that tonight as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Frances. Are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, hi, Great. Lindsay. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, Lindsay, uh, I have a presentation, a PowerPoint. Can you uh, allow me to share video? Um, you might be able to. Have you tried? I, uh, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. But it's telling me. Okay, I'm looking. Yeah, I've never seen that before. Keep talking while I look at yeah. buttons and Meg will help me too. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Francis McLaughlin. Um, I work in the Anchorage Planning Department. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak and for your participation in the Spinard Community Council. Okay, co-host has asked you to start your video. Start video and then, okay, so you should be able to see me. Now I'll share screen and here's my presentation. Um, my computer's a little slow and- Great, it's coming around, we can see it now. Sweet, all right. Um, I hit the button and I think it's gonna take a second to load. All right, okay, here we go. So um, yeah, so I'm excited to tell you about an important project uh, for the zoning code and homeless shelters. Um, so uh, homeless and transient shelters, um, they're defined in our zoning code as a facility designed to provide minimum necessities of life, including overnight accommodations uh, on a limited short-term basis for individuals and families during periods of dislocation or emergency pending formulation of longer-term planning. Um, homeless shelters are only allowed in one zoning district, um, which is the public lands and institutions district. Most PLI zoning is parkland, fire stations, hospitals, schools, and our universities. Also, you can see from uh, this uh, zoning map on the left-hand side of the screen that the PLI district is not near services for homeless people or public transit routes. We're facing a crisis where there are not enough shelter beds for the number of people who need them. This is especially acute now. Uh, Brother Francis Shelter is down 70% capacity um, 
uh, due to uh, COVID-19 CDC guidelines. So they normally can house um, overnight 240 people. They're only able to accept 72 right now. The Anchorage Gospel Rescue Mission normally takes 70 and they're only able to take 30 right now. We need to allow homeless shelters in more than one zoning district. Other cities allow them in residential, commercial, and industrial zoning districts. For Anchorage, we believe that commercial districts are more compatible than um, either residential or industrial. Um, the B3 district, general business district, is highlighted on this map. You can see that it is a commercial district located along major transportation corridors. Uh, we're proposing that uh, shelters be allowed in this one and only uh, additional zoning district. Um, this requires an amendment to the zoning code. Uh, the next slide shows uh, what that looks like. Um, so um, use types um, such as homeless shelters um, on the left hand side of the screen and zoning districts are on the top of the screen. So you can see the B3 district and you can see the PLI district far over to the right. Um, and um, this is the zoning codes table of allowed uses and um, all the blanks um, in these cells mean that the use type is prohibited, not allowed. The C means that it's a conditional use permit. The Planning and Zoning Commission is made up of nine professionals from various fields and is confirmed to the commission by the assembly. The commission decides whether or not to approve conditional use applications after holding a public hearing um, in the assembly chambers and based on the nine approval criteria. On your screen, you'll see the nine approval criteria. The first one is consistency with the comprehensive plan. That's our sort of roadmap for our community. The second one is consistency with the intent of the zoning district and any district specific uh, requirements or district specific standards. The third is consistency with use specific standards. Fourth is uh, site size, dimension, shape, location, and topography are adequate for the needs of the proposed use. The fifth one is the proposed use will not alter the character of the surrounding area. Um, the uh, sixth is compatibility uh, with uses allowed on adjacent properties. Seventh is any significant adverse impacts anticipated result from this use will be mitigated. The eighth is appropriately located with respect to transportation systems. The ninth is appropriately located with respect to existing um, um, infrastructure, water supply, fire and police protection, wastewater disposal, stormwater disposal, and other similar facilities and services. Um, this is a flow chart um, of the conditional use process. So it starts on the left-hand side, a pre-application conference um, from the applicant with the municipality and state agencies is required. Also a, a community meeting with the community council is required. Then the applicant um, may submit an application. Um, then um, the community council, the public, um, reviewing agencies all begin their review and there's a public hearing uh, in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, currently, homeless shelters have no use specific standards. It's, you know, they're only allowed in one district. It's a conditional use, but there's no specific standards for that. We're proposing that there be three. They're bullet pointed here. That they, uh, there be a 500 foot separation distance between shelters. Um, the second one is that uh, they shall be located within a quarter mile of a transit route uh, unless the, um, the shelter provides an alternative mode of transportation to the clients. And then the third is that um, secure storage is provided for personal belongings on site, including um, uh, uh, bike parking. Um, so what's the process um, to allow homeless shelters in the B3 district and add uh, these use specific standards? Um, this is the text amendment um, uh, flow chart, um, the text amendment process. Um, it's similar to the conditional use process, but it goes all the way to the assembly. So uh, first planning forwards a case to the community councils and reviewing agencies. Of course, we would be grateful for the Spinar Community Council support at that time. Um, there will be a public hearing for the Planning and Zoning Commission and then another public hearing in front of the assembly. This process takes about a year. Um, so next steps. Uh, um, we released a community discussion draft of the, uh, uh, the draft ordinance. Um, we'll schedule it um, for a uh, public hearing in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission in about four months um, in March. Um, the assembly uh, would not see this until after the, the middle of uh, the next summer. 
Uh, finally, uh, this is me. I'm Francis McLaughlin. Thanks for your time. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I kind of ran through it more quickly than uh, my presentation than I normally do, but I wanted to be respectful of everybody's time. And, um, uh, you know, there's been so much discussion. It's getting late in the evening. And I, I just wanted to make sure I got out there my points and then uh, allowed you all time to um, uh, discuss. Thank you, Francis. Can I, before we go to Pamela with a question, can I just ask you to give a sentence or two recap about what this ordinance is and what it would do? Yeah, so uh, currently um, homeless shelters are only allowed in one zoning district and um, uh, we're proposing that it be allowed in uh, the B3 uh, district as well. So adding one additional zoning district um, also adding uh, three specific rest restrictions that would apply to all um, new homeless shelters. Um, and the reason for this is that, you know, there are people that are getting turned away from the Sullivan Arena tonight because there aren't enough um, shelter beds uh, for people. And it's, uh, it's a crisis. Um, we need more beds. We need the flexibility to do, do homeless shelters in more than one zoning district. Um, mm -hmm. This ordinance, uh, while long and drawn out, if it um, gets adopted by the assembly, uh, would allow uh, some flexibility to provide uh, um, shelters in more than one zoning district. Thanks. Thank you. And then we'll go to Pamela Rager, Dave Bronson, and then Tom McGrath. Hi, I just have a, a couple of questions about the zoning. Uh, first and foremost, what, did zoning and planning uh, go through the process of looking at what this would mean long term to the city because if I understand you correctly you're talking about B3 being open uh, and unrestricted I think your words were uh, without restrictions to all homeless shelters uh, just wondering how much due diligence was done prior to this um, uh, what I said um, was that uh, currently um, uh, homeless shelters are only allowed in the PLI, Public Lands and Institutions District, and that um, there's no uh, use uh, specific standards for them. We're proposing uh, to change the zoning code to allow the B3 district um, to have um, uh, homeless shelters as well um, as a conditional use, um, which requires a public hearing through the conditional use process to be approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. And we're adding um, three use specific standards um, to all homeless shelters, whether they be in the PLI district or the B3. Um, we, the Planning Department researched um, other communities um, and uh, looked at best practices and um, you know, looked at the need. And um, you know, this is a, a small but important step um, I think that it's good for the community as a whole. I hope that answers your question. I'm afraid that I, I just really, was the zoning and planning process undergone before all of this, or are you proposing this and then going to put it there? Uh, I'm still not clear on exactly how you got where you are. Oh, I think I uh, know what you're saying. So, um, uh, so, I've been asked um, to start a project to change the zoning code. Um, if, if the project, if the assembly adopts the change that I'm proposing, it won't happen until um, sometime next summer. Um, I've written something that is uh, up on the planning department's webpage and it's called a community discussion draft. So it's something to look at and to, um, you know, send me comments on. Um, uh, at some point, um, I will schedule a case um, to go before the Planning and Zoning Commission um, and have a public hearing in March. Um, and uh, there'll be a public hearing on it. And if the commission recommends approval uh, for the ordinance, then it'll be forwarded to the assembly. Um, and that's when it would reach the assembly for a second public hearing uh, sometime, um, you know, in like, July or around that time. Thank you for the clarification. I appreciate it. Thanks for the question. Thank you. And then we'll go to Dave Bronson and then Tom McGrath. Dave, 
Dave's working on the unmute. Tom? Oh, Dave got it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Hey, um, Lindsay, thank you very much. I've uh, had my, I, I did the wave thing for quite a while here. I'd like to ask Ashley, ask her question unrelated to Mr. McLaughlin's statements, and it's for uh, our two assembly members that are there, and that is this real quick. Uh, well, knowing, I, I'd actually, that the, uh, I'd actually want to hold off and keep us on this topic then. Um, so I'll go to Tom okay. McGrath. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. Frank, thanks, uh, Francis, for bringing this forward. Uh, I think it's really needed, except for under your second point, where if they can have transportation other than public transportation available, it would be okay. The Spinard Community Council went through this with the South Central Foundation on C Street many years ago, where the South Central Foundation promised everybody that they would work it out, that there would be transportation for their clients. It turns out that the transportation for their clients actually drops the clients off on Arctic, uh, which is probably what, three quarters of a mile from South Central Foundation. It's not acceptable at all. And it wasn't acceptable to the council many years ago. So I would encourage the council to take a very strong stance against that portion of the second bullet point uh, so if there is a uh, homeless shelter or facility in a B3, which I support, that they have to be on a bus route so that the people that are using the facility uh, can get from and to that facility easily. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Um, part of the reason I had asked Franson was to clarify what is this about is because it is a technical and, and um, yeah, yeah. I could tell by the table that you showed. So really appreciate you coming tonight. And it sounds like there's a number of months ahead yeah. where we could take a look as a council at the um, community working discussion draft, draft. Yep. discussion yep. draft. Yeah. Um, yeah, and potentially uh, weigh in or provide comments as a community council on this, um, and also invite the planning department back uh, as we go forward and on, as things change and develop. Thanks, Lindsay, you run a great meeting. Great, thank you, thanks for joining. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to um, move our discussion, our decision topic five about our traffic calming resolution to next month because we'll be able to pass that before uh, spring and summer comes. And we are running late. It's uh, almost a quarter to nine. And I'm uh, proposing that we uh, extend the meeting till 9 p.m. and have time for the community uh, and neighborhood announcements section. Uh, a lot of people stayed on. I know there's still a lot of questions and conversation that we can have. And so I'm gonna do my best to try to, to navigate it so we can keep moving forward. Uh, in, this, in this time, we usually ask people to share out for up to two minutes about um, who you are, what issues are of interest to you. Uh, you could find other folks who have some common uh, issues in, in different pockets and neighborhoods in Spinard. And so I wanna make sure that we can give time to that because there is so much going on right now. So I have see some hands and so I'll go there and if people can continue to, to keep putting uh, questions into the chat or uh, waving at me, that kind of thing. Uh, so we'll go to um, Dave Bronson, your hand is still up. So if you'd like to uh, speak, you can. Uh, Cameron also put in the comment his contact information if anybody wants to follow up directly with our assembly member. And then we'll go to Dustin and then I'll see if others get in a queue. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Paul. Okay, Lindsay, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Hey, I just had a real quick question for the two assembly members, if they're still here. I believe they are. Uh, in the light, or it, knowing that the World Health Organization um, recommends strongly against shutdowns, um, I just want to know what uh, um, our acting mayor knows and our assembly members know that the World Health Organization uh, does not know about. Um, 
about shutdowns because we're uh, we're literally destroying our city here, um, and I'd sure like to know the reason. Uh, I just looked at the de- uh, Department of Health and uh, uh, Social Services from the state, and I don't see where the numbers are on the three limiting factors that they're using. I don't see the crisis. So I, I can uh, go back to mute, and I'd sure like uh, our two assembly members uh, to answer that question. Thank you very much. Sure, we have one assembly member, Cameron. Yeah, it's a short question with a long answer. And, and I, wanna, I wanna give time to make sure that everyone has a chance to do their community update. And so um, Dave, I, I'd be happy to call you or if you wanna call me, I left my cell number on, on, the, on the, the chat and I'd love to, to have a conversation with you offline. Thanks. Yeah, we can okay. do that, thank you. Thank you. And then we'll go um, to Dustin and then Paul, Kim, Mike Robbins, and Amber. Hi there. So my name, my name is Dustin Sherman. Uh, and I actually have a question for uh, Cameron uh, as well. And I, I put this in the chat and he replied to it, but I didn't, we didn't really get an answer hookup on that. So as someone uh, myself and my wife, we've both actually been through COVID. My wife had spent six days in the hospital, uh, almost ended up on a ventilator. We got lucky she didn't end up being that bad. My question is this, is the assembly is trying to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And with the lockdowns and everything else that they've instituted, they basically said which businesses could be open, which ones couldn't. There are businesses out there that uh, don't spread the virus. And mine, the one that I work for is one of those, but there's other businesses out there that do spread this and, and there's proof of it if you were to, to do any research. Um, one of those businesses would be tattoo parlors. I hate to say this and, and I don't wanna see anybody shut down, but if they're gonna dictate which businesses can and can't stay open, this is a big one. And I have tattoos, I actually enjoy them. But every time a needle hits the skin, blood plasma goes everywhere. Um, they can't tell me it doesn't, and those are those businesses are allowed to stay open. So it, the hypocrisy with this is is kind of staggering. And I just wanted to bring that to attention and see maybe if Cameron or if any other assembly member wants to answer as to why that a medical place and this would be considered a medical place. They have their standards that they have to reach um, whenever there's a pandemic or whatever you want to call this is out there. Why are they allowed to stay open? Thanks you. Cameron, do you want to respond? Well, uh, again, that's a, um, um, and I, and I can actually, um, I, um, offline, Jason Malakinstead and I have been, have been sort of going back and forth. Um, and, um, and I, I would invite J- Jason to, to share his thoughts on, on that. Jason, are you, are you still on? Well, again, I'm not sure he, he's, he's still on. I does, does, does us and I don't want to take too much of the time. So um, I left my, my cell, cell phone on there. And why don't, why don't you and I have a conversation over the phone? Sounds so good to me. Give me a call. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, next, we'll go to Paul and then Kim, Mike Robbins, and Amber. Hey, Lindsay. Um, I'm concerned about the lockdowns as well. And I'm concerned about... Um, the targeting of businesses like ours and the the unintended consequences of what's going on with people outside of COVID and uh, et cetera. So I wrote up a resolution. It's before uh, downtown had it uh, tonight. It's going before a bunch of community councils. We didn't have time to get it on this agenda, uh, asking basically to rescind 16. Um, since we can't do anything here as a council, I would encourage folks that are concerned about it to write to their assembly members and to the mayor and um, do what we can do, uh, even if it's, I don't know. If you, anybody wants a copy of it, um, I can leave either my email here, or maybe the council could post it on the Facebook page so people just read it. Uh, appreciate that. I appreciate everybody for coming out tonight and um, just looking forward to get through this. We've had a, it's been very, very tough and uh, the secondary and tertiary consequences of these decisions, we've had 116 deaths in Anchorage, which is tragic. With a population close to 300,000, though, it's, it's, it just the numbers just seem, compared to the economic devastation going on, just seem unreasonable, and particularly over Christmas. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much, Lindsay. 
Yeah, thank you, Paul. And folks can email every assembly member if they email wwmas at muni.org. So that's another good way to reach everyone. Um, thank you. So we'll go to Kim. Yeah, thank um, you. My comment isn't quite such a uh, important thing as COVID. So um, hopefully this is appropriate, but um, I just thank you for hosting this meeting, Lindsay and all the people present. Um, I've lived now in this area for 20 years. I grew up in the area. I actually went to school at Woodland Park Elementary and live down the street from it now as a boys and girls club. So my question is about that and it already might have been covered in past meetings, but um, I love that the boys and girls club is being um, so widely used. Um, I hate to see a building empty, so it's great that it's being used, but it is very scary as a homeowner to be driving and there's just such an issue with parking. And I'm wondering if anybody has ever looked at, um, there is parking, there's a bike trail that's in very bad condition because of tree roots at the end of the um, hockey rink. And I feel like um, there could be some parking available there that's really just being used by taxi cabs, which we need taxi cabs. So, I mean, maybe that's a possibility too, but I just feel like there's an accident waiting to happen. Um, so whereas I love seeing the building being used, I'm just hoping we can somehow address parking um, and just a safer um, access point for families to be using the building. Um, but again, thank you for hosting the meeting. Yeah, thank you for that comment, Kim. And that is something our council could look into. And I'm looking at some folks, Peggy, Bob, to see if this has ever come up before us. Um, but we may be able to weigh in on uh, supporting uh, repaving that, that trail. I know exactly what you're talking about. And I'm not sure about the parking issue and how that has worked out. So we'll, we can look into it some more. Thank you. Oh, Cameron, did you want to respond to that? No, I just wanted to, to say that um, that I, you know I apologize if if uh, if I, it seems like I'm not, I'm not responding to the, the the questions. I'm trying to look at the time and make sure that we have enough time for everybody to speak. Um, mm -hmm. The issues that we're talking about aren't simple, and there's not a quick, simple answer that I can 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 give. I'm I'm as I'm as con concerned and torn on these issues as as all of you are, and and I don't have a, a, a short you know quick answer. So I would really encourage those of you who want to talk, talk about this with me and share your concerns and thoughts to reach out to me and talk, talk with me. Um, and I will bring those kind of concerns to the, the, the assembly and, and make sure that they're part of the, the decision-making process that we go, go through. Um, I'm not sure that this, that this late latest order is, is the right, right direction. I, I either, um, I'm, I, I definitely want to hear from you and want to make sure that your, your voices are heard. So I just want to say that, um, and I apologize if, if I haven't spoken as much as I, as I should have, I wanted to make sure that I created space for, for all, all of you to speak. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so next we'll go to Mike Robbins and then back to Amber Glasser. You're still muted. There we go. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, and I just have to say, uh, having grown up in Spinard, uh, it does it does my <laughs> it feels really good to see so many people uh, on this community council meeting. I've been, uh, of course, I'm running for mayor, and uh, I've been making the rounds and going to different community council meetings uh, for the last couple of months. And and this is the most well attended council meeting I have been to, bar none. And I just want to say congratulations to all of you guys. And congratulations for taking um, and having pride enough in the community and, and being concerned enough that you're willing to give up a couple of hours of your evening to, uh, to try and pay attention to what's going on with our city and our government. Uh, we have a plan that we think uh, is going to help Anchorage be a cleaner, safer, and more prosperous city. And I, just, I came to listen tonight more than anything else. And, and just uh, I, I'm just blown away and, and I'm proud to say that I'm from Spinard and I do have a solution for that representation issue. And that solution is once I'm mayor, you can count me as your mayor from Spinard because that's where I lived for the first 20, 15 or 20 years that I, I was in Alaska. So uh, I just wanna say thank you for letting me uh, introduce myself and I'm looking forward to coming back for the candidate forum. 
Great, thank you. Amber. All right, um, I would like to say thank you. You know, I've been in and out of these meetings for quite some time, probably a couple of years, maybe a year and a half. And, um, you know, I'm glad that I've finally figured out how to use my voice. I've always had a voice. I turn my video off because it's very hard for me to not get emotional. Um, my big question is how do we get our restaurants and bars open before the four weeks is over? This is an important question. My second question is, I know I, I've waited on probably this entire city. I started at Lucky Wishbone when I was 15. I've worked at Village Inn. I've worked at Cattle Company. I opened Table 6. I don't know if you are aware that Table 6, um, I'm trying to help raise funds so we can pay their rent this month because Alex Perez, also one of the ex-executive chefs for Simon and Seaforts, might just pull the plug, okay? And that means what's happening to Hot Quarter Grill? What about Marx Brothers? 40 years. And Van said that, you know what? They might not open after this four weeks. So if there is a way to get our restaurants and bars open before the four weeks is over, that needs to be our number one priority. Other states are doing it. Other cities are doing it. And, you know, that's a little bit selfish of me because our kids should be number one and schools should be open. 100%. So I, I'm, I apologize for being a little bit selfish there on that. Um, but these are thousands of people who just want to work and they have masks on. So anyone who's at home working from home, just accusing all of us of not wearing our masks, everyone and everywhere I go, someone has some kind of face covering. I have PTSD. I've had physical abuse. I grew up in Spinard. I moved here when I was 10. Um, I went to Willowcrest Romig West. I graduated from SAVE with a scholarship. I've worked full time since I was 15 in this city. I left for four years to California to go to college. I've been back ever since. And I am floored that we are doing this to our community. I, I am completely blindsided. I can't understand why the assembly would just single out one industry. It's absurd. So I don't wanna take up too much more time, but that's where my heart is and, and we can do better than this. Mm -hmm. And people are wearing masks and masks I don't even wanna get started on masks, but even if we don't agree with it, we are doing it out of respect for every single person in this community because that's what we have is respect and love. And we need to start following our hearts and doing more things with love. And the data, excuse me, data is, is all wonky and everybody knows it. So that's all I got. Thank you, Amber. I've seen your name and we've emailed a few times, but I appreciate hearing you speak and using your voice. Thank you. Um, we have another hand raised from ASD. Can you introduce yourself for some sure, next as well? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And I would just like to um, echo what was just said. You know, we are a community and we do need more love for sure. My concern has been, um, I'm a born and raised ASD product. I went through Title I schools from um, elementary on. So Airport Heights, Muldoon, Tarmigan, Wendler, East High School. I got my undergrad um, from UAA in early childhood. My first master's was from UAS, um, cross-cultural education. My second master's from UAS and uh, literacy K-12. And I have a big question because it keeps coming up. It keeps coming up that people are concerned that we aren't opening schools and there's a very big push for anti-teachers unions. And I'm not asking for this to be answered, of course, but I'm putting this out there because it continues to be put out there. There's this weird push that somehow the teachers union is um, behind all this and that they have so much power and it's quite not true. <laughs> um, what our community does based on safety measures and what we do in terms of following our emergency orders, those are in place. And Dr. Bishop is doing what she is granted to do and allowed to do. And so I just put this out there into the universe and to all those on, on um, I'm, I'm reading some chat here. 
Yeah. Yeah, they are. They are. Thank you, Kim. The, the Anchorage school, school District is working on training subs. Um, however, they're very limited because we don't want the subs to be at multiple schools because then they'd be in multiple pods and that's not what we're working for. So there are subs assigned to certain schools that we can get. And um, when people speak to this, they need to understand and know that <clears throat> If COVID cases are high and teachers, as much as we like to think we're super fun and different, we're not. Um, if we have to quarantine due to exposure, we do that. So we can't guarantee that. Um, and I see Pamela's uh, commenting school closing isn't based on science. Yeah, so I can't speak to anything of, that's coming up in the comments there, except that um, if we're, asked to quarantine that's what we do and so i would just put this out there that this weird like there's been a huge push for anti-teachers union and anti what are they doing and i am i'm confused about where that's coming from and what that means and i'm super happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and educate on that um but i think there's some confusion and i'm happy mm -hmm. to talk thank you Thanks. Can can you it, or in the chat or share your your name for our attendance? I, I think I missed it. You're muted though, so I can't hear. No worries. Still, it's okay. Misty. M I S T Y. Thank you. Okay. And if you could put in your last name too, it's for our attendance records. I think everyone else has done that. Okay, does anyone else have a community announcement or neighborhood issue to share? Lindsay, since it's nine o'clock, I move to adjourn. Hey, thanks, Tom. Any second? I second. Paul? Okay, I Peggy, second. Peggy formally seconds. Um, I just want to thank everybody for the discussion tonight and the long meeting. And I recognize a lot of people are getting sick right now and a lot of people are, are, are furloughed and there's so much going on right now and just want to make sure that we show up as neighbors to each other. So thank you all for coming and I'm glad that we can keep building this network together. Good night everyone. I'll see you in thank January you, 2021. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Right. Happy holidays everybody. <laughs>